Introducing our speaker this morning is Dr. Sherry Larson Heckley. Our speaker this morning is Ruth Delight Hubbard. You heard me that right. Her middle name is Delight. And Ruth has served the Lord with delight in a number of roles, from Christian High School English teacher to Withcliffe's Vice President for Communications and Branding. Recently, she stepped in to serve as InterVarsity's Director for the Urbana Conference. And she, I am delighted to tell you, she's the first woman to serve in that role. Long ago, long, long ago, in the ways many of you measure history, she served as a summer teaching English as a summer teacher in China and then went on to recruit at Urbana for ELIC that December. In those two occasions, one of the most foolish things she ever did was befriend me. And now, um, I want, those are some things she's done. Let me tell you a couple things about who she is before she comes up and you get to listen to her. Ruth loves God with a contagious confidence in how much God loves her and me and you. And out of that confidence, she listens to voices that some of us would never hear. And then she listens in ways that make it possible for her to tell their story. And that contagious confidence and faith and that contagious love for others makes her a person who's worth listening to. So please join me in welcoming Ruth Hubbard. Well, good morning. It is a delight to be here. I use that word a lot, and mostly people don't know it's my name, so it doesn't sound so arrogant. <laughs> uh, but, but it is a delight to be here. And, and it's not just because when I left Madison, Wisconsin, a few days ago, there was still snow on the ground, although, boy, is it nice here. And it's not just because I have a little kink in my neck from kind of going mountains, ocean, mountains, ocean. And where I come from, it's mostly cow, cow. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, maybe just a little bit like that. So before I kind of get into the meat of this morning, uh, the, the Urbana Student Missions Conference happens every three years between Christmas and New Year's. It's designed to be a discerning space, designed specifically for people between the ages of 18 and 27. Do you know any of those? <laughs> to be a place where we can stand before God and see in new and fresh ways who He is, to see what he's doing in the world through his church that is diverse and global, to experience the goodness of his spirit and son and his people, and to say, God, what would you have from me next and next and next? Urban 87 is a place where I said yes to God in ways that became significant for a decade or more in my life, and I kept saying yes. Urbana 2000 was a place where I said yes to God again. And Urbana 15 was a place where I said yes to God again. So I would always invite you to come to Urbana and say yes. This year we'll be studying from the book of Revelation. Not a typical missions passage of scripture comes from. It's, it's just not typical. But, but that's where we're going to hover. And the book of Revelation is serving as our foundation for the entire conference. And in that book, at the very beginning, Jesus is named as the faithful witness. And that has inspired the program team to be the theme for the conference, is faithful witness. So while they're doing their good hard work and digging into Revelation, I've been doing what I do, which is kind of like meander around and look to see where else I see scripture and my own life talking about faithful witnesses. And so when I said to God, what would you have me bring to these, your beloved students who are at Westmont? He said, talk to them about the faithful witnesses. So part of what will happen this morning is I want to tell you a few stories from the faithful witnesses who have impacted my life. But we'll start here. I grew up an only child of a Baptist preacher and his wife. And we were mostly in small church congregations. And my parents have this high value for hospitality. So our guest room was almost always full. And while there were only three of us in my immediate family, there were a lot of full chairs around the table, especially on Sunday at noon. 
I don't think my mom, I, I, know, I know my mom just sort of had this thing. She collected up strays on Sunday morning. And so you, as a college student, if you would have visited our church on a Sunday, you would have had the question, Do you, would you like to come for lunch? And you would have been welcome. You, you would have found other students there, missionaries there, friends of my parents from their college and seminary days, other people in the church perhaps. There was almost always a full table and I loved being in a space around this table where we shared the things that God was doing in our lives. I, I promise you, it didn't feel like a church service around that table. It wasn't really formal. But when I look back, that's what we heard. This is what God is doing in our lives. This is how God is faithful. This is who God is. I didn't realize until much later in my life that my mom was really intentional about how she cooked on Sundays, particularly, so that she could invite anyone who might show up. You see, my mom made meatloaf, not hamburgers. She made a pot roast, not pork chops. She made mashed potatoes, not baked potatoes, because those things stretch better. And part of what she taught me was, there's always enough, there's always room, we'll make room, we'll find a way. She was part of the faithful witnesses in my own life. Now, there's another community of witnesses, and you'll read about them in Hebrews chapter 12. That's what we're going to focus on today. Hebrews 12, first three verses, and it begins with a therefore statement. Therefore, since we're, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race set out for us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The author of Hebrews talks about these people as a cloud of witnesses, and I, I, maybe a little bit because of the running metaphor that's in there, and maybe a little bit because of the fact that I was an only child, I always imagined the cloud of witnesses as an arena filled with fans cheering me on. Go! Like, that, that was what it was. Anybody else want to just confess to the fact that you've thought that? Or you might have even heard a sermon about these people, like, cheering you up. I started digging around, and I have a Greek dictionary, and I sort of know how to use it. <laughs> and so I started digging around, and I found out this word, witnesses, that's translated that, is talking about people who are giving witness to something they have seen or done or know. This cloud is a cloud of people who proclaim what they've experienced. And in this context, specifically about who God is and what he's done and what he's promised and what we can count on him doing next. I love this image of this cloud. And so my mom is one of those people, one of the people from my cloud who invited everyone to the table and taught me to make meatloaf instead of hamburgers. So here we are, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3. We've got this we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, but I don't want you to miss something, and this is where I, I like to argue with tra Bible translators, which is a ridiculous thing to do because they have way more credentials than I do. Or maybe I'm arguing with pastors who have sometimes said, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, therefore we should throw off, we should, f we should run, and we should fix our eyes. Like, you know, they go, okay, we should do these three things. I don't think that there's three things to do, I think there's two. I, I honestly believe that this passage is saying to us, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off, let's run, because our eyes are fixed on Jesus. There is a sense in which the communities that we're called to be very aware of in our throwing off and our running are the, the community of witnesses and Jesus himself who is the faithful witness, the perfect witness of who God is and what he has done. And then there's, it's almost parenthetical, but it's not. We aren't supposed to miss it at all. Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So in the moments that we have together, I want to share a few stories with you about some of those faithful witnesses in my own life, uh, people who have taught me about who God is. Two of them are Ethel and Iris. Sweet names. 
They're missionaries with Wycliffe Bible translators. They went off to northern Mexico in the years before I was born. So this is ancient. And uh, they, they went up into the mountains that, by horseback is how they got there. They were living in a small cabin-like facility. It was part of an abandoned boarding school. They were going to do community development, education kinds of things in this place. And there was a caretaker on the facility. And he and his wife provided them three meals a day for every day, all three meals, tortilla and brown boiled brown beans. And there they were. They were doing the thing that God had created and called them to do. One morning, Iris woke up with one of those kinds of sore throats where she couldn't swallow very well. Even her own spit was a little complicated. Dice spit was complicated. And, and so the rice and the, tor or the, the tortillas and the beans were horrid to try to eat. That sore throat went on for a few days. Ethel started to get nervous and began to pray for her, as you would expect. Iris comes out one morning and says, you know what sounds really good? A, a poached egg. Now, they don't, they don't have any eggs. So Ethel says, I'm going to pray for that. Because at least a few times since we've been here, an egg vendor has wandered by and sold us the two eggs they had or the one egg they had. And so I'm going to pray. I believe that God is going to send you an egg today. Ethel prayed, and they went about their day. And all day long, Ethel kept watching out on the horizon, looking out their windows with no screens, their door with no door, waiting, certain, expecting that someone was going to show up and sell them an egg. Got to be near the end of the day, and Ethel is now sitting on the front steps and watching. Iris comes out, blanket around her shoulder, sits down next to her. The sun is beginning to hit the top of the treetops in the distance, and Iris says, looks like there's no egg today. And as they're sitting there together, kind of thinking about that reality, out of the corner of her eye, Ethel sees something and hears, and looks, and it's this rusty, nasty, mangy chicken <laughs> coming toward her, kind of giving a look at the house like, I think I want to live in there because chickens do that sometimes. It gets close enough to Ethel, and Ethel kicks at it and shoes it away, and the chicken flies off. And Iris says to her, as some of you already are thinking, um, that's the closest thing to an egg I've seen all day. <laughs> what, why do you? And Ethel thinks, oh, no. Only moments later, here comes the chicken again, and this time it's got a look like I am going in there. And it comes at him. I won't do my chicken impersonation. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I might. It's going. <laughs> Gets up about five feet away, looks Ethel right in the eyes, and then flies up over her head and into the house. <laughs> and then they wait. They don't know what's going to happen. And they sit quiet. Almost ten minutes. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> And the chicken comes flying out over their shoulders, and off it goes in a thing. They both get up, they go into the house, and on Ethel's army cot, on top of her sleeping bag, there is a beautiful egg that God had provided. The egg. Yeah. You didn't know you were coming to hear about chickens and eggs today, but we did, and don't ask me which came first, because we all know. I just told you the story, the chicken came first. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. Among all the things I learned from these two women, and there are many things, uh, they both needed each other's faithful witness in order for this day to come out the way it is. Iris was exhausted. She was sick. And she, will, she will said, if you hear a longer version of her story, that she really didn't believe an egg would come that day. She didn't believe when Ethel prayed that anything was going to happen. She really didn't have faith. And in a way, Iris had to draft behind Ethel's faith. She had to draft behind Ethel's confidence in God. And don't you need people to draft behind sometimes? I do. So, so Iris had that experience. On the other hand, Ethel was so certain that she knew how God was going to answer her prayer that she almost missed the chicken and almost missed his answer. And Iris had to point out to her the place where eggs come from so that she wouldn't miss that thing. So you and I have hindrances like that. I don't have to convince you that sin is a hard thing, but we have hindrances and we need each other so that we don't miss out on what God is going to do. Another faithful witness, his name is Ed. 
Ed's love for God and God's mission did not lead Ed to be a missionary or to do anything in full-time ministry at all. Ed was wired to be a scientist. But he knew a lot of missionaries because he really did care about what God was doing in the world. And so he asked these missionaries, would you, when you're out in these remote places where you work and where you live, would you either mail to me or bring me samples of the soil? Bring me some dirt. And mark on the canister or the box where this came from. So in the early 1950s, a guy in Borneo sent Ed a box of dirt from out in the jungle somewhere. And Ed, as an organic chemist with Eli Lilly in Indianapolis, began to examine the dirt. And in that dirt, he found a bacteria. And there's a scientist or two in the room, and so I'm going to not pronounce it well, but at least I'm going to use the right name. Ed isolated the antibiotic vancomycin from that sample. And if you know anything at all about antibiotics, and some of you might from personal experience, vancomycin is one of the most used antibiotics in the world. It has saved millions of lives in the last 60, 70 years. In fact, it saved my dad's life just a couple of weeks ago. So here's someone who reminds us that God's calling on our life is specific and unique to us. Now, Scripture is really clear. There are a few things about our calling, about the way marked out for us, that we hold in common. The clearest one of those is that Jesus is the way. There is something unique about Jesus and who he is as the Son of God that is very important for all of us to understand. But there are also unique ways in which God has created you and calls you, like he called Ed, to bring good to the world, to save lives, to be a healer by playing with dirt in a laboratory in Indianapolis. Scripture tells us in Ephesians, you are God's workmanship. You are created by God's design to do the good works that he creates for you to do. In Ed's case, it was as an organic chemist. And I need people like Ed to remind me of that truth. Now, I was a journalism kind of major. I started out, I changed my major. Do any of you have this problem? You start out as one thing, you change your mind about it, you go in another way, then you merge two things together, and suddenly it comes out, and then you get, someday you're gonna experience this, and then you'll get a job in a completely different thing. It's sweet. <laughs> So I was a graphic arts journalism major, and as a journalism major, I would call what I'm about to do a sidebar. When I taught school, my students call these rabbit trails. Sometimes they're more fun than others. But I, I, I look back at the passage we're looking at. Therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, you're Westmont students, and so you know when there's a therefore, you have to go to the text that precedes it to see what the therefore is therefore. So we'll do that. And if you do, the 11th chapter is sort of the faith hall of fame. It lists all kinds of people like Ethel and Iris and Ed, but their names like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Rahab. Okay, so that. And you could go there, spend weeks in that passage, going back and forth to the Old Testament and reading the faithful witness that their lives provide for us. But at the very beginning of the chapter, we read this definition of faith. Verse 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Most of us have expectations about our lives, about how it's going to go, about what's going to happen. I'm just about to do the thing that used to make me crazy when I was a student sitting in a gymnasium a lot like this in a chapel when the speaker would say, now when I was your age. But honestly, for my whole life, I've had expectations about how my life was going to go. And the, the, the picture I would have drawn for you when I was 19 and 20 and 21 is very different than the life that I lived in many, many ways. So you come to terms with that. Some of you have, some of you are, some of you will. Some of you will fight that for a long time. But we have these expectations. I think the expectations sometimes sound like this confidence in what we hope for, but I think they're two different things. I think there's a difference between an expectation and an anticipation. Expectation has control to it. What I expect, I expect specifically. Anticipation leaves room. Ethel expected an egg by way of an egg salesman. Anticipation allowed for the chicken to be the deliverer of God's provision. 
expectation is something uh, that often leaves us disappointed, doesn't it? Don't people disappoint you? Doesn't God disappoint you when you expect certain things from him that he doesn't do? You expect him to protect your home and the debris flow takes it. You expect him to save something, provide something, do something in a certain way. You expect him to deliver the ring by spring. I'm sure that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> Anticipation assumes that God is already working, already providing solutions. It helps move a scientist like Ed to keep looking for bacteria in the dirt because the God who is the healer certainly intends to bring healing for all the things that this, that, that bacteria, that, that diseases, that infections are doing, all of that, and so he just keeps looking. As you listen to this last story, listen for the places where expectation get in the way and anticipation opens the door for God. This is a story about my friend. I haven't seen him for a couple of years now. I'm going to call him K. He was born in Iran. He went to university in India and met people there who loved Jesus and introduced him to Christ and to the Word of God. And Cam, Cam, Cam became a follower of Christ. He became a discipler and eventually a disciple maker. And through a dream, he heard a calling to go back and bear witness of Jesus' love to his own people in Iran. And he's done that in a lot of different ways over years. At the same time, he got married, he had a few children, uh, he lived in the United States for a period of time, and then he and his wife believed it was, the time was right to go to Iran and to be a part of God's work there. And, and so they did. He went there and he was a trainer and teacher of church planters from his own community and doing good work in this place. And then, as they expected could very well happen, he and his wife were arrested. And as they were held in prison over many, many weeks, uh, they were tortured, they were tormented, uh, they were interrogated for long, long periods of time. Uh, the psychological abuse at one point included the, the captors um, making him believe, making Kay believe that his wife was dead, that she died in prison. I mean, so you can imagine the kind of angst. Your kids are still in the country, but they don't know where you are. Now you believe your wife is dead. You're physically and emotionally and spiritually exhausted. So one day, like many days, he was picked up in his cell, he was blindfolded, hauled to the interrogation room, sat on a chair in a corner of the room, facing the corner. The interrogator who'd, who'd been hassling him for weeks at this time comes in and begins the whole process. And Cam finds himself in the midst of this, realizing that this man sounds really tired. And so he asks permission, can I, may I ask you something? May I, may I make a statement to you? The guy says, yeah, fine, whatever. You sound really tired. And the man says, well, people like you who make me work like this, my back is killing me. And Cam, th these are his own words. Um, Cam writes, I was, it was at that moment in my miserable condition as his prisoner that I felt my heart grow warm with the love of God for this man. And I responded in that love. So Cam asked him, he says, can I pray for you? And the man agreed, and, and, and he's told me before, he says, I, I wasn't surprised that he agreed. Muslims, if you ask them if you can pray for them, they'll say yes. And he, the, the, the guy probably thought he was going to go back to his cell and pray for him at some point, or that it was just one of those polite things you say to people. Oh, how are you? Oh, yeah, rotten day. Oh, I'll pray for you. And you don't, but, you know, it's the thing you say. So he's probably thought that. The case says, no, no, no. And so imagine he's sitting in the corner with blindfold on. He says, no, 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 would you come over here so I can lay my hand on your back? I want to pray for you. And there is silence in the room that goes on for a while. And finally, his interrogator says to him, you know, sometimes when I go away from here at night, in my dreams, I see Jesus. Maybe someday I will be a Christian too.
It was there and then that the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, made sense to me in a way I had never in my life experienced so deeply. I sat in awe of the fact that God was using me as his instrument in his hand. Cam lived out a faith that was resolute in confidence. But hear this, I've heard a long version of his story that has a lot more twists and turns. His faith was not perfect. It was not resolute all the time. He had incredible crises of faith where he was so angry and so hurt, he quit praying for periods of time. But over the long haul, Jesus kept showing up in his life. Jesus kept giving him the strength to go. See, what part of what we need to understand is that as we fix our eyes on Jesus, he is the one who authors and completes our faith. He plants the small seed. He brings it to flourishing. He brings it to completion. The one who began a good work in you will see it to the end. This is confidence. Our faith is a gift of grace from God. And so therefore, since you, since we, are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and look around the room, some of that cloud is here. Since you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything that hinders. Throw off the sin that so easily entangles. And run with perseverance the race marked out for you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Two of the people Another two people who speak of a faithful witness to me are some of my colleagues. Uh, Jonathan um, and Priscilla Walton are spoken word poets. And they speak God's truth and his invitation to you and to me to not only experience the ministry of those who are the faithful witnesses in our lives, but to be faithful witnesses for one another. And I want to share a poem, this poem that they have recently done for us. And it is also not just our prayer, but our benediction today. So listen to this.